Parenthood is a time of so much change for you and your baby. A little reliable information can go a long way towards making this new life a good life. I'm Jessica Rolf, and this is My New Life, a Love Every Podcast. Play. It's got so much to teach us, children and parents alike. But sometimes we parents can get a little too involved with our child's play. When does our guidance become interference? And what amount of direction is appropriate? Here to help us strike the right balance is Dave Neal. He is a researcher in the psychology of play and learning at the Center for Play, Education, Development, and Learning at the University of Cambridge. So Dave, you've spent a lot of time studying play. And when you talk about this kind of sweet spot in your research, you talk about the sweet spot of support that a parent can provide while not being too involved. Can you kind of walk me through an example of a parent you've observed that strikes that right balance? Yeah, I think there are two ways of like looking at it. I mean, some play experiences and other kinds of interaction involve some sort of problem solving or attempting to achieve some kind of goal. And in some of my research, I looked at parents and infants playing with a ring stacking toy. And so some of the parents would, for example, if their child just looked at the toy and maybe picked up and, and mouthed the rings, but didn't really do anything else with them, then the parent would sort of put a ring on themselves and show that that was something you could do. And then the baby might try and do that, but they might struggle to properly get it on. So perhaps the adult would kind of demonstrate again. And then if they're still point at the top of the uh, stacking tower, and if the infant was still struggling, then they might sort of slightly help them by nudging it towards the top and letting it fall on. And then the infant at that point might just pick up another ring independently and might try again and might even succeed or get close to succeeding. And so the parents would then gradually withdraw their help and kind of only introduce as much help as felt like it was necessary. Like some parents might, as soon as the infant appeared to be struggling with the ring, kind of just basically put it on for them which then removes the learning opportunity for the infant to kind of experience the failure and to understand the particular ability and the sort of agency, the feeling that they've succeeded at something rather than having it taken over for them. So that's one kind of view. There's also this idea of playing with your child in a way that keeps it as a very playful experience, but introduces learning opportunities, which is what has been termed guided play and has become um, something that's been researched and looked into more and more over the past few years. And it's this idea of trying to strike a balance between a structured learning experience and a play experience so that you try to keep the learning benefits of play, which is motivating and fun and engaging and led by the child, while also having some of the benefits of a structured learning experience where there's some kind of learning introduced because what can often happen is a parent can see their child playing with something, decide that they are going to interact with the child, and what they can do is turn that into a sort of teaching situation instead of a play situation where they're explicitly trying to get their child to do something by directing them particularly to a particular sort of objective. Oh, uh, Dave, I've been there. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> complete the puzzle <laughs> complete <Yes>. it <laughs> yeah yeah so there's more um uh if your child is aiming for a particular objective then uh, the best thing is potentially the kind of thing i just described where you're sort of offering them some assistance as it's needed and otherwise you can kind of instead of them direct instead of directing them towards an objective that you think is important see what they're interested in, what they're doing, and kind of let them continuously lead the interaction, but just look for opportunities to insert moments of learning into that interaction. So if they're playing with a particular toy, you could ask them a question about that toy or point to a feature of that toy they might not have otherwise noticed, ask them questions about what it can do and what they like about it, try to sort of engage with what they are already interested in and what they're doing at a sort of equal level rather than taking over the experience and directing them. So this is such a nuanced balance and it's so important to hear about. We have a ball drop box at home and I have, let's imagine, you know, my baby was 10 months old. He's 
now, you know, a little bit older than that, but what are some signs that I was being too prescriptive or too overbearing? So for example, you know, I really wanted my baby to drop that ball in the hole Mm -hmm. of the box. That is how the toy works Uh in my mind. In my mind, that is the success. And I knew it was right to let him explore, but I just like couldn't help myself saying, okay, you know, try to put the ball in the hole, in the right, in the hole. Uh So can you just help me just a little bit more? So the parent, for the parents that are listening of how to strike this balance between kind of helping them put the ring on the ring stacker or the ball in the hole versus letting them just kind of explore the material. We call them, you know, materials in the Montessori world, explore the materials completely naturally with no demonstration or no understanding of kind of how the toy quote unquote works. Right. So the ball does go on the hole. The rings do go on the stacker. Yeah. Well, I mean, one way of doing it is to kind of just try to gradually increase what you are doing slowly and so for first of all, you just put the toy in front of them, let them play with it and explore it. And maybe, you know, they'll pick up the ball and just put it straight in. And that's kind of it. And if they don't do that and they're playing with it for a while, as long as they're interested in that toy and the, you see the, the problem can be is if they just don't seem to have any interest in it and want to do something else, in which case, I mean, demonstration, I think, is the first thing, taking the ball and putting it in and showing them that is possible. And that might then mean, oh, they're interested in it and they want to engage with it. But I think if they just completely seem uninterested and want to do something else, then it starts to become better to maybe see what they are interested in and focus on that instead. But presuming they do seem interested in it, then I would kind of gradually like do demonstration, then hand them the ball and then kind of wait and then maybe demonstrate again if they still don't act on it and then maybe point at the hole if they're still not doing it and sort of gradually and then you can kind of direct their hand to the hole and then put the ball in but you kind of don't do those those things like directing the hand until you've seen if they can do it with the demonstration seen if they can do it just with the pointing so you're just gradually increasing so it's basically not going too fast in terms of how much you direct them try to think well what's the minimal way i can direct them okay that's not worked what's a a one step up of how i could direct them how to do this and always make sure that they're still kind of engaged and interested and seem to be enjoying themselves because as soon as that stops you have i mean the experience you're doing with them might still be beneficial in some ways but the benefits of a sort of play interaction will have disappeared because it's no longer play if they're feeling forced into doing something and aren't really enjoying it Mm, that is so wise and so helpful for us to hear. It sounds like patience is really the key. <laughs> we have to just slow down. Everything moves so fast these days and it's so hard to just take a minute to just be slow with your child. But it sounds like observing them, taking these kind of micro observations and taking them you know, one step further if they are interested is the key. Yeah, I think that's a good general principle. And I think also sometimes a lot of good things can happen if you just engage in playing with your child and make sure that you're actually engaging in playing and just think of it in those terms, just sit down and, and play as well as like an equal with your child, make sure you're having fun and enjoying it. Try things with the toys, do different stuff. And so you don't become someone who's kind of in any way leading or taking over. You just become completely a play partner and, And in that kind of experience, you might just naturally introduce some learning opportunities because your child will see you do certain things. They'll hear the language you use to describe stuff. And in that sense, you're kind of capturing potentially some learning benefits through play. And you don't have to do a lot of work yourself planning that or thinking about all you have to do is kind of let yourself go and actually play. That's great. And what does it look like with a parent that is not as engaged? So, you know, we've talked about kind of the the tendency for some of us to be over-engaged. I think there's also a tendency, I've been there where, mm-hmm. you know, I just distracted, right, by our phones and by everything that's in, in our world. And so what does it look like for a parent who's not involved enough? What I think can happen in that situation is that the child will, um, if you think of the ring toy, um, they might try to put the ring on the toy and if the, and they might not be able to, and if the parent does nothing at all, maybe they'll try again another couple of times. They still can't do it and they'll drop it and they'll give up. And at that point they haven't really learned much. They've just learned, I can't do this thing and they'll move on to something else. So they haven't had a learning opportunity about how to think about something, how to do something manually 
and they haven't experienced any sense of sort of agency and personal achievement. So there is a danger that experiences are reduced in that kind of way if there is no interaction. And we do, there have been some studies looking at when parents are distracted by like a phone call or uh, something on their phone while interacting with their child that seem to suggest that if you compare parents who get distracted in that way, if you put, if you put parents and children into a learning into an environment and ask the parent to kind of teach or show the child something, then if you distract some of them with something like that and the others you don't, then you find that the ones who were distracted, their children seem to have learned less from the experience than the other ones. So in the Montessori world, there is this focus on really investing in your child's concentration. And so parents want their children to be able to concentrate. And I almost feel like sometimes I'm suppressing some wanting to have be excited or be engaged or be verbally engaged with my baby when I'm trying to follow the Montessori path of, you know, letting them really concentrate because it's, it's hard to concentrate when somebody's talking to you. I mean, if a child is focused on something very intently and you talk to them, I mean, one of the important things I think is, as I was saying earlier, is not to redirect your child's attention elsewhere, but kind of follow their interests. So if they were particularly focused on a particular toy, then if you are going to uh, talk, then maybe point a part of it and ask them about it or do move a little part of it or something. But at that point, you kind of I guess, shift what's happening into them potentially learning something from you and then potentially having a bonding experience with you or whatever. Whereas if they're intently gazed, um, engaged with the object on their own and doing their own sort of thinking about it or exploration of it, then that will be a different type of potential learning experience. So I think you would want them to have the opportunity to do both of those kinds of things and not always do one or the other. So we have a final question that we love to ask our guests. What's your favorite learning activity to do with a baby? A baby somewhere between zero and one. I think there are some things, some tests in psychology that have been done that are very interesting to do that are kind of playful, but also just sort of amusing and very interesting for parents and adults like the A not B task that's very well known, which can be done with children under one. And there's a few different variants of it, which you could find online if you search for A, A dash not dash B task. But the basic principle is you will put a two sort of cloths down, small cloths, like handkerchief kind of size. And you will take a little toy or some kind of object that's interesting to the baby and you'll show it them. Um, and then you'll just quickly hide it under the cloth on the left. And then you'll just let them look for it and they'll pick up the cloth and they'll get it. And they'll normally be all happy and kind of laugh. And then you repeat that again um, and they'll find it again and take it out and laugh. And you normally do that maybe three times and then you just put it under the other one. Hmm. And what they will almost always do is go for the same cloth they went for the previous times. They'll watch you, they'll look at the object, and they'll watch you put it under the one on their left, and they'll pick up the cloth on their right, which is the one they've been picking up all the time. Fascinating. So and it's very interesting to see that actually happen. And as I said, it's quite different. It varies with their age, and it varies by each infant individually, the extent to which they do it. And But you can also get variants of it that work with sort of slightly older or slightly younger children. But it's entertaining, I think, both for the baby and the adult to see that and engage with that task. And the explanations for it are diverse, and it's still debated about exactly why that happens. Yeah, all sorts of things come to mind as to why the baby would do either one. So, oh, I can't wait to try that. Thank you. Well, it's been so wonderful talking to you, Dave. Thank you so much for taking time out of your, you know, your research and your all the important work that you do to to connect with us today. That's okay. Thank you. Let's review some ways in which you can help your baby get the most out of their playtime. Takeaway number one: give opportunities to explore and don't try to run the show. Let's say you are playing with a ring stacker and your baby is mouthing the rings and not trying to put them on the stacker. You can demonstrate for your baby how to slide the rings onto the post. 
When your baby tries and struggles, help them with a little nudge and then withdraw your help and see what happens. Takeaway number two, give your infant just one toy at a time to allow them to explore each in depth. Takeaway number three, exploring how your baby's brain works can be fun. Try the A, not B test by switching up the location of a favorite toy hidden under two identical cloths. The first couple of times, place the object hidden under cloth A and then hide the object under cloth B. Your baby will almost always go for cloth A again, even though they saw you make the switch. Love Every's stage-based toys are designed to facilitate the kind of guided play we discussed in this episode. Learn more at loveevery.com. You've been listening to My New Life. If you think this episode might be helpful to a fellow parent, please share. And if you'd like to learn more about the topics discussed in today's show, head over to loveevery.com. That's L-O-V-E-V-E-R-Y.com. I'm Jessica Rolfe. Thanks for listening.